There's 150 years of survival. She changed the whole perception of the country. We've had to lean upon each other's strength to get here. Certainly did split this town right down the middle. Now, why do I have to pay for the land that you stole from my people? She doesn't want it for Eva Rickard, she doesn't want it for Bob Duke, she wants it for Davy Farnley, for everybody. I'll give my job, my life, for what I believe in now. People down the South Island ringing up for help. People in Australia ringing up for help. I supported the stand of the Tahitian people for their self-determination. Even was identified as, as, uh, as going to be somebody that's going to lead. Uh, they, they, you know, whatever the task may have been, whether it was big or small, if there's something to, to lead a small group of us children, Eva was always there. She was always mata mu motem onga mahi. Fiddy fiddy things, whether it was you know, fundraising for the boys overseas or whatever, Eva was clearly identified at that time. She had that depth in her background that was her, her, her mum was a very strong person. Her grandparents always taught in a quiet, soft, Man. But she was always the calm, the, the one that would always say, oh, just a minute, let's think it out, you see. Yeah, was well, I'm out to be hung, and she goes, no, just a minute. She always went, just a minute. When they talk about bodies as being radicals or protesters or shit stirrers, activists or whatever, what they're actually, actually doing is denigrating the message that those people are trying to put forward. <clears throat> Eva Rickard has been described as all of those things, including the Wicked Witch of the West. Eva is, in fact, a great Māori patriot. She's one of our great fighters. <laughs> We talk about biculturalism and there's a Pākehā understanding and then there is a Māori understanding. The Pākehā understanding of biculturalism is being sensitive to Māori and Māori issues. A Māori understanding of biculturalism is sharing power where decisions are made. And those two viewpoints have got to come together and we must not kid ourselves that one viewpoint is the other. They've got to dialogue a little bit more. The minute you talk about sovereignty, you're speaking in a different language. And being in a different language, there are many subtleties and definitions which arise from that language, culture and background. And so there's changes in interpretation going on dependent on at what level of interaction the negotiation, the discussion, the policy making is taking place. And so sovereignty can take on all sorts of meanings dependent on who wants to use it and who has control. <laughs> O te tau ko ta imano i warau i wa te kau maono. E o ki ana ngā maara ki ngā wā i tū ki no te ai, a taka i ai e tau iwi, ngā iwi tūturu tāngata o enua o te ao. A i ngā roa i o rātou mana matu ake. Ki a atia, te rāna o ki te wā. Tāia i e rātou te karo i tau atu ki no tanga. 
ya dua kiano tora tu mana macu ake itango iara. Wetai kita wa, wetai wia te wai ngaloa. Wata tau itora tau mana macu ake tanga. Me tora tau papa wenuanui idoroi te cinolang ati datang. Wete nei kau papa takut tau tokuan. Kau kaeri cia te wia te wai ngaloa. Iralu ina tika nga waka aere katua e no opu mauana iralo i te kaupapa mana mochu ake. A ka waka aere tia oki iralu ina tika nga tua wakarele a nga tūpuna. Grandfather, speak to me of being woman when a child's grandmother taught me magical lessons. Papa tuwa luku, earth mother. Nurturing, caring, loving, my brother, my sister, my mother, my father. Sacred circle of farmers, eternal flame, Ahika. What the treaty, Nena, her moko funer us. It's a paper with some words on that bind us to our past. I was the eighth of a family of 15. And my mum is um, Lydia Rapana Kafari. She was from Ngati Kua, from the South Island. And she influenced a lot of my life. She asked me to come home and live on the land. I said, you and your stinking Māori land mother, because she was always fighting in the Māori land for the land. And, I, and she sat down, crossed her legs and cried. I said, right, I'll dry your tears, I'll come home. And what a job. I'm quite, um, I'm quite brushed off, actually, because you can't get away from the land. You can't get away from the responsibilities that the land has for the Māori race. And my mum was one of those. threw two boys off the bridge. I don't know where they are now. We went to a dance at the cabaret way down near the big wharf. And they caught up with us local boys and they had a cheek to toss for us. Cheek! So we said in Māori to each other, they're going to pay for that. So we get on to the footbridge. Eva, how about a kiss? Yeah, get up here on the rail, says Eva. So he climbs up on the rail and she shoves him over, you see. That's off the footbridge coming over to him. All you heard was, ah, splash! And we could hear this cursing coming from down below. Yeah, Mary, so and so. <laughs> I said, they're alive and away we went. <laughs> You are entering the very heart of the world's murder capital. The city with a major, major drug problem. Armed police patrol neighborhoods reduced by the drug trade to war zones. They're already yelling insults at us. They sort of now they're throwing rocks. You'll meet the godfather of one of Colombia's powerful drug families. Then comes the moment I'm not sure I've been waiting for. Don Fabio has granted us a rare interview. In association with Singapore Airlines and Air New Zealand. Full circle with Michael Palin. 8.30 Tuesday on 1. Bonus bonds, a solid investment that every month has over 150,000 cash prizes, over $5 million in prize money, including a massive $300,000 first prize. Bonus bonds, turning investment into excitement. If someone gets aggro on the road, don't take offence. Take time out and stay cool. Believe me, it pays. You could win all this and more in the ultimate Christmas hamper. Details in tomorrow's New Zealand Advertiser.
Take it left 20 degrees. Beautiful planet. It's kind of boring, though. Photo quality on any paper. Photo Ret 2. Only from HP. Ready for Lotto's $3 million Christmas Super Draw. Every ticket also has a chance to win one of three BTIS Honda Accords. So make sure you get your tickets this week. Oh, oh, I know. It's not, uh, not, uh... Oh, I know, I know. It's not, uh... It's not, uh, it's not, uh... Her last album has become one of the biggest albums of all time. And now, her new album... Celine Dion... Also featuring... The love theme from the movie Titanic. Guests include Pavarotti, The Bee Gees and Brian Adams. Celine Dion. Let's talk about love. Bonus bonds. Turning investments into excitement. To find out more, call 0800 8 bonds Or visit any branch of ANZ, Postbank or Post Shop. Bonus bonds. Call 0800 826 637. She's a fine looking young girl. She had many of uh, guys there. Uh, trotting after Eva in her heydays and we had until we had this uh, guy that wrote in on his white steed, this young Tex Rickard that blew in as a post office clerk and uh, wooed her off her feet. Maybe that's what used to make her climb out the window when, when she lived with my parents when I was probably knee high to a grasshopper to go and see Tex was uh, he had that magic, <laughs> whatever it took. <laughs> it's always been exciting, eh? There's always something coming up. Uh, you know, Eva's a woman that uh, gets tangled up in all sorts of things, you know. Mm. Our phone goes continuously, you know, people down the South Island ringing up for help, people in Australia ringing up for help, you know, and how the hell do they know that, you know, they, they expect her to do the impossible. Mm. And he said she'd rush in like a whirlwind, grab a suitcase, chuck a lot of gear in, throw it in the boot of the car, and she's off. And maybe about eight hours later, she'd get a, he'd get a phone call. She's ringing from Wellington, not ringing from Auckland or Kaitai. So he doesn't even know where she's going. So, you know, so he's been very supportive of her. He's been the low key guy in the background. And a gentleman is the, the best way I can describe the guy. A real man. A Ngati Pro man come up here, met his doom when he met Eva. And he's been there ever since. July this year will be our 50th year. How many children have you got? Well we, well, we had one, uh, one died as a baby, uh, nine children. wanted to build an emergency airfield between Auckland and New Plymouth. The most suitable place? Ragland. This is a Maori graveyard, the Urupas. Yes, she lived on that land and they promised the land would come back you after the war. Promise me. And the man who negotiated the deal for the government, a former director of civil aviation, Gibby Gibson. Uh, well, I landed at Ang Laragland on the 13th of February, 1936, and by chance met some of the representatives of the Maori owners of the land. They told me the whole history of the land, but after a discussion with them, they said that they thought the land could be made available uh, 
if there was a cast iron guarantee given that the land would be handed back to them when it was no longer wanted for aviation purposes. And uh, I said, well, I'm authorised to give you that guarantee, but it will be confirmed in writing from Wellington. He was a man of honour. He will never be uh, forgotten in, with my race. He'd given his word mm -hmm. to the Maori elders, who it was a verbal agreement, mm -hmm. paperwork would follow, so he'd given his word, and that had been destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, and he always believed that you know, Victorian view, a word as good as your bond. All this Ngati Hodo is burial ground, mm. all this area, and it's a very ancient burial ground. So I said to her, when I die, I want to be buried here. What did you tell me, Granny? She said, yes, they'll use you for playing golf on, and she says, and I don't think that's very nice. I am going to use people's power. I'm going to call this country to come and help us to fence off our graveyards. And maybe the golf club and the county council and this government will see that we do mean business and we are serious about it. We knew, we knew that it, she was right. We knew that this was, this was the strongest case of any, I think, of, you know, of injustice. And uh, I had no, no, no doubt about it. I mean, I had, that was my proudest day, actually getting arrested down there. You are being instructed to leave the golf course. I'm not breaking the law and I refuse to be lying. You with that jumpsuit, you're wearing your number. With the jumpsuit. Eva's own people themselves, she had very little help from them. Because they, they reckon that she was mad when she, when she went for this, you know, fought for this land. Uh, she's done some things I've never always agreed with, you know, on many, many issues. Uh, but uh, in saying that, she, she believes in what she says. She gets up and she'll say it loud and clear, regardless of the backlash uh, that may transpire afterwards. For me, the land issue here is very real because I can see by the legislation of this country and by what's happened to my people, it's racist. I'll give my job, my life, for what I believe in now is the rightful inheritance of my people. And as I say to them, if I occupy that land, I will die there. And that is the dedication I have had for this land. I've gone old and poor, lost all my so-called friends, since I have, you know, jumped on the so-called bandwagon. There's no bandwagon, my friend. It's for real. And I just really don't know what has possessed me to take the stand, but something just keeps driving me on. And she pursued a lonely path on that one, but gradually she changed the whole perception of the country that this was an issue that wasn't being picked up by a crazy person, but was an issue of justice that had to be seen to be done, and that what Eva Rickard was on about was right, and that she was right, and that she was asking for justice to be achieved. And I think that was a great, great achievement. As Eva Rickard went to the Maori Land Court in Hamilton today, the 11-year legal battle she's led for her people was at last all but over. A bit nostalgic about it all, wondering why it had to happen. After all the years of struggle, the proceedings inside the court to get the land title back took just 10 minutes. The thing we've got to remember mostly, of course, this was the trend, this was the role model for the treaty, uh, what was to become later the, the Rauparu settlements. It started, started right here in Whangaroa. We had three acres set aside for housing. Now we can go ahead and develop the housing of my people. We've got work skills at the moment, uh, TAPS programs, small motors. So we're trying to utilize the land as best as we could for our survival. We, as final to defend your trust, is a charitable trust. We are the only employing agency. The young ones only get 10% above the dole. They don't have to come to work, but they do here. They are earning their dole money, and I admire them for it. In, in a six-month period, we had we had up to 80 people here working. We used to drain the whole town out, you know, uh, continuously working. We had we had carpentry, mechanics, engineering, catering, carving, um, office administration. Uh, we we had about eight modules running at the time, and about eight people in each module. Then we had we had to have supervisors. Then we had a, a learning assistant, super, uh, assistant 
who did nothing but teach people to read, to um, go for their driver's licenses and all that sort of thing. And that, he, we had a full-time full -time man doing that. Evil unearthed in New Zealand's past. These masks were taken shortly after they were hanged. Two tales of crime without remorse. A bloodbath on Mongatapu Mountain had just begun. A young man's mysterious demise in the heart of Auckland. The murder scene was down there amongst those trees. It was too late for Horatio. And the story of an infamous and bloody crime spree. The men are tied up and led off the track and told that they will be released later. This is a lie. Epitaph, 7.30 Wednesday on 1. New Zealand's fallen in love with the cause. Their sensational new album is Talk on Corners. Featuring the first single, Only When I Sleep. Playing live in Christchurch, Wellington and Auckland in February. Don't miss The Cause. The Cause new album, Talk on Corners. With electronic ticketing from Air New Zealand National and Link, you fly without a care in the world. Morning. John Thomas travelling to Dunedin. There you go, Miss Thomas. Gate 3, boarding now. Flight NZ411, now boarding. Current temperature in Dunedin, minus 2 degrees. So, all you need to get on the plane is your name. Air New Zealand. It's our business to make you feel at home. Only last week, I murdered a rock, injured a stone, hospitalized a brick. I'm so mean, I make medicine sick. When we were kids, the incredible Academy Award winning true story of Muhammad Ali's rumble in the jungle. It's not only about boxing, it's about the human experience. You won't be disappointed. Buy this incredible video for Christmas. Only $29.95 at all good video retailers. Allison's Fashions have a full range of summer garments at really reasonable prices. Good quality and in a variety of styles with well-known labels. Larger sizes are a specialty and we can help you look just great. Our swimwear collection has just arrived with vibrant colours and designs to suit all tastes. For all your summer garments, visit... If you're an employer or someone looking for workers, stop digging around because they're not in the sand. Phone student job search on 07 856 You never saw a guy with such quiet resolve, such terrific ability to just walk forward each day, face the music, get the job done, and uh, yeah, he's, he's one in a million. We had a chap come out of the gangs. Uh, he was in, in prison. And uh, even I went to a Maori District Council meeting, and this woman got up and pleaded with the people there to take this this boy. He didn't speak to us for three months. And uh, when my kids came home for Christmas, the three daughters all had young babies. And the first one that walked in said, "Oh, well, who the hell are you? Where do you come from? Here, yeah, nurse my baby." You see, so <laughs> gave him the baby and. You know, before the holidays were finished, he was feeding the baby, was changing them and, and joking with our kids. And that's what brought him out of his shell. Mm. Apparently, he came from a broken family. He had about seven or eight brothers and sisters. And he had an invalid father. Mm. So he had to go out and steal to, to feed the family. Mm. You know, you just need a few. You know, when you talk about Jesus and his 12 men, revolutionized the world and they're still talking about him 2,000 years later. Mm. You only had 12. I don't need an army, I don't need 1,200. I just need 12 people that's got it here and the will to work. Hello, 
My name is Kaipo Ferreira. I'm from Hawaii. I'm from the island of Maui. My mountain is Haleakala, the house of the rising sun. My people come from Kahiki Nui and Kapueo Kahi. <clears throat> I'm here to, so, as a Kanaka Maoli, Tangata Māori, to support my cousins, especially on this day uh, here at Whangaroa in the declaration of their independence. Did you hear I got expelled from French Polynesia? Oh my God! <laughs> as an indigenous person, I supported the stand of the Tahitian people for their self-determination. And I think it is about time that the Tahitians had some say in what is happening around their countryside. Well, the United Nations Charter says that all peoples have the rights of self-determination. They have the rights to determine their relationship with any other government, any other power, any other body. Our work is to be able to connect and support our cousins right throughout Mwananui Akiwa. Because as you think about it, we have the same leo, we have the same whakapapa, we have the same culture, the histories and stories. And from the very north to Hawaii, to Aotearoa in the south, and to Rapa Nui in the far east, we're probably one of the largest nations in the world in terms of a people. Give and take means cultures to be shared. I can sing the songs you know, for mine you're not prepared. Uh, my tribal area is Manera, and I've got an organization called Dunich, which is means they are. I came over to uh, help uh, celebrate an independent state with um, Eva Rickard. So uh, we have big problems over there, all our deaths in custody, uh, um, like all our major problems are caused, you know, like alcohol is a big cause of that. It's, you know, like the, the, uh, the main cause, as far as I can see, is displacement, the way we're conditioned through society, you know, to believe that we are a minority in their sense of the word, you know. And um, so, you know, alcohol helps to... Um, like helps people to forget that and you know, they, and the way that they forget it is by killing themselves. <laughs> so. I believe it was a struggle be began in the 1800s when the missionaries first came here and took over and our people turned into nice loving Christianized people that was in the 1835s. You know, I'm the most bloody colonized Māori that was ever born. <laughs> I was, I had picture hats, high heel shoes, name it, I did it. And now in my old age, my tupuna has whispered in my ear, Eva, go back to what you were. Go back and be us. Oh, <laughs> Uh, uh, me O rātau whakāro, o rātau hina naro e rio i te karauna. Nō reira, a rātuno e tai rōpū mō hiwana hoki wōku whakamahara ki tētai rōpū ko te komoa, Māori Organisation of Human Rights. Ko tērā tērā rōpū i mua i te tīmata tana o nā tamato, ko eira tētai rōpū i kite hau, i rono hau, i te pai o a rātau, te mārama o a rātau kaupapa, and I recognise and honour the memory of our tūpuna who had the wisdom, firstly, to see that they had to state categorically that this land was ours and would always be, and that uh, they had to 
defend it, to ensure that their children would have a place on which to stand. Uh, but it's a question of how the decisions are made as to who joins us and the pace at which they join us. Don't forget that in the 1980s we went through an economic restructuring that, in my estimation, has put Māoris at the bottom of the heap and that wealth is basically redistributed upwards away from Māori people. And within that context, we now have an immigration policy which brings people in from Asia who can meet the economic criteria. So they simply intensify the economic uh, divisions uh, that have been created in this country since the mid-80s. Uh, we have felt that to participate in the decision about who will come and live in Aotearoa, New Zealand, is one that Māori should be vitally uh, concerned with. Today is building a political institution, a health system, an education system, or anything else, if you divorce it from what we are and from where we came. Western religions, Christianity, but stay close to the way to the ancient ones, knowing I have survived. I will survive. I hear your prayers, old ones. Those songs that enter my heart, I will sing. Mahina is the white hair of my mother. And the little tamariki, my mokopuna at the back, is Hautai. I thought I would give my name Hautai to my mokopuna, so when I pass on into the spirit world, I will leave a Hautai behind, and she will have to live up to her name. And I think she's doing a good job. So you look at my moko. All my ancestors are on my face. I've carried them on my back through my struggles and uh, they've helped me. And my father's ancestry is on the right side and my mother's ancestry is on this side, the Kaparu line. Somebody said to me, Eva, get a moko. I said, why? He said, you've earned it. And I thought about it and I said, no, you don't earn the moko, you live it. Eighteen sixty-three was the Rangiriri Wars, and that's when he was fourteen. He escaped from there, and when his mum and dad got uh, shot, I mean, they were killed at Rangiriri, and he was fourteen at the time. He had a bullet wound in his shoulder, I believe, and he walked all the way to Raglan. So he migrated down here, came down south. His memory has been revived with all the ropa to kōrero because it was yep. all about compensating people who lost their lives and land. People like this. 
blood money it's called. And the Waikato settlement brought it all back to life. For me it did, knowing that the blood of my ancestors was spilt there, and there are my people eating the money for their blood. Ropatu is blood money. And a lot of people would not accept it. And, I call, and of course the settlement, for me, revived the suffering of my people. And it doesn't wear well in my brain. Yeah. Hotai. I, I knew I had to walk up there for those shoes. Hotai, sea breeze. I said, I'm the ninth sea breeze. <laughs> Tuai was the other lady from oh, here wonderful. that was brought up for a wife, for an old man up Waikato. And she was from here. And my second name is after her, and she must have been a great lady. And I was researching the Ragan Golf Course, and I come across this Tuai Wangati Pale. And she was taking the government to court for a commission of inquiry into a confiscated people's lands. That was in 1904. Now, how old was she when she was challenging the government at that time? 29. And I thought, crikey, she's my namesake. And that's right. But, uh, and I thought to myself, well, I wonder if this is why I'm like this, trying to finish off their jobs trying to research all the wrongs that have been done. So they didn't die in vain, I thought, okay. Koinei to tupuna, hautai. Kei raro i te whenua, kei raro i a papa tūnuku to tupuna e takoto ana. Kei roto i te whenua. E hako e jujuai. padlock on it. Now, it really represents the system. So we've had uh, 17 keys made for the 17 that were arrested on that day. I think uh, every time uh, people get depressed, they can come down here and unlock that chain and feel good about it. Because it really got the ball rolling as far as Māori land things were concerned. And it actually came out a success because the land did come back. And they didn't fight for nothing. They didn't get arrested just for nothing. It actually succeeded. We have the desire, we have the will, we have the ability to achieve. Often we do not have the resources. Given those resources, and my vision of where the Maori people can be in Aotearoa is limitless. this weekend to remember the sacrifice that our people made so we can stand free on this land and declare our independent state of Whangaroa. Mm -hmm. If they would only exercise their rangatiratanga instead of talking about it, we'll get a long way. So I just hope that today the declaration of the independent state of Whangaroa is going to give them that hope and inspire our people to get together and talk about their future and their pathway into the year 2000 and past that. The concept of establishing an independent state on the mind of Māori Motuake is a concept that has been very much to the forefront of just about every Māori in the country. And so the struggle that she has carried in terms of her struggles in her territory relate to every part of the country. 
the kaupapa is actually talking tino rangatiratanga. Talking tino rangatiratanga. But it needs to be clarified so that we all understand from the whanau to the hapu to the iwi that you cannot make a decision based on tino rangatiratanga within your whanau which might jeopardize the tino rangatiratanga of the hapu. Ne? Mm. And so that continues on so that any decision that the hapu might make must also consider the wider community of interaction. But fear, anger, hate, strangers lost to their roots, different ways, progress, technology, white collars, destroying sacred houses, removing language, removing rituals, gods, goddesses come calling me barbaric, savage, native. I asked my accusers what is being anti-Pākehā. You know, because within my life, I know there are good Pākehā. I don't hate the Pākehās, I don't. They're part of this nation, they came here, I don't know whether they wanted to or not, but they're here. And we mixed with them, we lived with them, we shared our land with them. What else? Can they say I'm anti-Pākehā when they shared my land, they shared my culture, they shared my house, they shared everything that my Tupunas had. We say we can live together. We, that doesn't mean to say we're going to kick all the Pākehā out. No, it doesn't mean that. It's if we can honour the treaty, the last of Māori, but the Pākehā, honour the treaty in, within the spirit of the things that has been, which our Tupuna has signed in the blood, in the moko, in fairness. And to see the problem many Pākehā have is that they are Christian, and they remember the words of the of the Bible, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And they think that we're like them. They think that because they tried to commit genocide on us, that we want to commit genocide against them. I think that the experience historically of our people is a denial of that belief. So we want to develop that society and say to Pākehā, we want you to join us in this new society. Don't believe what the media put across there to watch out for that sort of mean looking face and say, so, I don't think so too. You know, I've got a two year old son, you know, and I can I can remember when I uh, when I went out there and it did my moko and I got home there about two or three days later and first time he seen his dad with a moko he sort of looked at me and he looked at me and he laughed. He never got frightened. <laughs> She was so proud of Eva. She was the first Māori to get the school C here. My ma grandmother had to piho to get me a uh, gym. You know what piho is, bartering, kumara. So we went around Queen's Avenue and she said, I want gym for my moko. So I got this gym dress from this big flash lady. The next house, I want shoes for my moko. So I got a pair of shoes. I said, jeez, I look neat in my new uniform. And they laughed. So at, at uh, half time, at break, I said to this girl, hey, why did you fall laugh at me? He says, look at your shoes. I said, what's wrong with them? They were high heel shoes with black, long black stockings. I wore high heel shoes because I'd never worn shoes before. So I came back. I said, that's all right. You fellas can laugh at me now, but I'm going to beat you all. So I made up my mind I was going to learn and beat them. You shared clothes, you shared troubles, you shared sorrow, you shared childbirth. No maternity home, of course. He said there was no maternity home here, so their mum would help deliver my mum's baby and vice versa. When I was having my babies, I felt like a queen. Everybody was waiting at our house to have a look at this new baby. They'd pass it around the house and they'd come back to me naked. They would have undressed it and looked at every joint in his body to see if he was all there. And they gave us a name, and by the time you got your baby back, 
It'll have about 12 names. Not the one that you want, it's the one the tribe wanted. So you just went along with your people, because they knew best. And when our nanas were alive, like, the first time I looked at her in town at Christmas, was like looking at her grandmother, I cried. She is so much like her grandmother. And I said, it was like the girl I knew was gone, the mother and teenager, all those sort of things, her grandmother stood there. I felt myself crying over her. Up here, where I find my rest. Up amongst my dead, because they're not dead to me. I learned all about my Māori side at the deathbed of my mother. What she did was left a piece of her in me and in all my children and in all my, um, hopefully my grandchildren, left some of her wisdom. She was a very wise lady. And I hope that one day I'll be as wise as my mother. Ara <laughs> Yeah, I reckon, I reckon we should really talk about equality and healing the nation. We should talk about the things that are going to help us into the year 2000. No more negative thoughts. 